And I do want to get to the latest out of the Middle East as we are taking a live look over at the Israel-Gaza border. The Israeli War Cabinet expected to meet today to discuss a proposed response to that attack by Iran. The Israel Defense Forces saying that along with its international partners, including the U.S., they were able to intercept more than 300 missiles and drones that were fired by Iran and its proxies. This was Iran's first ever direct attack on Israel with previous attacks done through its proxies. Faras Maksad is the senior director for strategic outreach and senior fellow at the Middle East Institute joining us now live to discuss all of this. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Josh, it's a pleasure. So first off, can you explain to me what the significance was of this attack by Iran over the weekend on Israel? Well, this attack was unprecedented, Josh. As you mentioned in your report, never before has Iran uh, attacked Israel directly. Now, there's a long history of, of violence between the two, of conflict, so people might be surprised to hear that. But Iran has a well-established preference for indirect warfare with Israel. And that's because Israel has superiority, military superiority, if it came to a head-to-head -head -head confrontation. So Iran has developed a network of, of proxies and militias throughout the region, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in order to harass Israel using these indirect ways of, of getting at it. So this is unprecedented because the Iranians, after Israel flattened their consulate in Damascus 12, 13 days ago now, killed a senior general there who was involved in planning attacks indirectly against Israel, felt that they needed to respond, that their deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Israel uh, was being depleted. And if they had not responded directly, that Israel will only be encouraged to do, to do more. And as you mentioned, there are proxies that are all over the Middle East. Can you break down for me what those proxies are? It's a term that you hear time and time again, and a lot of people don't fully grasp or comprehend what that means. Well, Iran has excelled, I should say, the Islamic Republic, which, uh, you know, came into power in 1979, uh, has excelled in taking advantage of power vacuums in the Middle East. Countries that have weak central authorities or have suffered conflict, like Lebanon and Syria after the civil war, Iraq over, after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein and the withdrawal of most American forces, Yemen, which is also in civil war. Iran has excelled in inserting itself in these broken countries and building militias there, it's training, sponsoring, providing arms. The most formidable of that network is Hezbollah in Lebanon, which in 2006 fought Israel for a month uh, and really kind of toe-to-toe -to -toe until the very last day kept firing those rockets. So there's a formidable network there. Uh, and Hezbollah, I have to say, in Lebanon is the, is the ace in the hole. It's, it's the concern here in Washington that we can see a second front uh, and in between Lebanon and Israel open up, and, and that would make Gaza look like a cakewalk. And I do want to talk a little bit more about a topic that's been discussed, I want to say, over the past several months, but really it's several years and decades, Iran's nuclear capabilities. What do we know about where all of that stands? Well, wh where we stand today is Iran is what we refer to as a threshold nuclear state. It hasn't overtly weaponized uh, its nuclear program. It has enough uh, uh, material, uh, uranium, to produce several bombs. It has enriched up to a 60% threshold, which is well beyond what it needs for uh, peaceful uh, nuclear energy. Uh, but it has not taken that last step to, to weaponize uh, and actually build the bomb. And the concern here is that we're, Iran is closer than ever to actually taking that last step. Should it decide to weaponize, most Western intelligence services believe that it would only take it a few weeks to, to have that bomb. Um, so it's very concerning, but there is kind of a quiet, uh, unwritten understanding between the Biden administration and Iran at this point, where Iran is precluded from taking that extra step uh, because of a threat of military action, either from Israel or the United States. And kind of piggybacking off of what you just said, we do know that President Biden said maybe 24, 48 hours prior to that attack by Iran, he was asked his message to Iran 
about the attack, and they said, he said, don't. It was a one-word answer. But as we know, Iran did strike Israel anyway. So my question for you is, does Iran fear the U.S.? What are their thoughts overall on the U.S.? Josh, uh, the, Iran does fear the U.S. and also fears Israel uh, for very different reasons. They have no interest in a direct confrontation or a broader war uh, with Israel. That's certainly something that they share with the Biden administration, which also had come in promising to end forever wars in the Middle East, withdrew in quite a dramatic and some would say catastrophic fashion uh, from Afghanistan. But Iran, because of its uh, military inferiority in a head-to-head -head conflict with Israel, does not want that conflict. Their attack to Israel was carefully choreographed and telegraphed over 12 days since their consulate was flattened in Damascus. So they basically told Washington and told Jerusalem that this attack is coming. And we had a very good idea of what it would look like. And that's part of the reason why the defense was so effective, the joint American-Israeli, but also we have to remember, for the first time, uh, President Arab countries contributed to that defense through intelligence and, and radar and opening up their airspace. So this joint coalition blunted that offense. I, I don't think that the Iranians want an all-out war in the region right now. We know that some of the countries that were involved in intercepting those missiles included Jordan. So my question for you, what are the thoughts on Iran overall in the Middle East? Who are its its allies? Yeah, well, I did mention that uh, although that Iran does not want an all out war right now for its own interests and reasons, it is still a very destabilizing force as, as, as far as most of its neighbors are concerned. Certainly a lot of the Arabs who feel that Iran has encroached on their sphere of influence and their interests, on their sovereignty. Iran, uh, you know, their generals have boasted, has influence and dominance, even maybe outright control of at least four Arab capitals, four Arab countries. And so there is a shared concern between many Arab countries and Israel, a common enemy, if, you, if I may, uh, in Iran. However, increasingly, as the Arabs continue to watch the bloodshed in Gaza after the tragic attack of October 7th in Israel, you know, some 30,000, 33,000 Palestinians have lost their lives, according to the UN, most of them women and children. That also causes quite a bit of public anger in the Arab street, which these countries, although no love, love for Iran, have to contend with. So it's a very delicate balance to be seen as supporting or defending Israel, uh, but also wanting to jointly push back against Iran. My last question for you here, is Iran prepared to go to war with Israel? I don't think so. And I think that uh, that's part of the, uh, the telegraphing and the choreography of, of that attack, although quite dramatic. I mean, 300 plus projectiles of various forms, killer drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles. Uh, part of the choreography and part of why they took 12 days, days to respond is because they wanted this to be symbolic uh, to restore deterrence for their also their own public audiences to save face, uh, but also to have it be limited and contained. And I think most of that firepower was limited to an Israeli military base in the Negev desert in the south of the country where Israel's attack on its consulate, on the Iranian consulate, emanated from. So the Iranians right now are bracing. They're hoping that whatever response comes from Israel is limited in fashion, and then we can move back to the kind of asymmetric gray zone warfare using, using the proxies rather than going at it directly. All right, Faraz Maksad, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today and help break all of this down. Anything else you want to add about any of this before I let you go? No, I, I would say that uh, this is a crucial time for the Middle East. Um, this is certainly on the precipice of a, of a possibility for an all-out war. Uh, what is unprecedented is that despite the carnage in Gaza, uh, there is a pathway. Uh, there are Arab countries who are eager to normalize. Some of them have already normalized relations with Israel uh, and want to integrate the region together to blunt Iranian influence. Uh, but there is no strategic victory for Israel in the alleyways of Gaza. Uh, eventually, Israel will have to go back to building that joint coalition against Israel in the region. So the carnage continues, unfortunately, but 
one hopes that we can preclude the worst by uh, avoiding a head-on Israeli-Iranian war in the coming days. All right. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We appreciate it. My pleasure.